everything flows, nothing abides. Everything gives way, nothing stays fixed. That was Greek philosopher Herculitis speaking about life. Hello and welcome to a brand new show, but occasional series called Icons. In this new show, we will try and bring to you investing insights from icons, both in India and internationally. I'm Ramesh Damani, your host. When he was just 17 years old, my guest started writing a column on Forex matters for the Pink Papers. A few years ago, Barron's, in a cover story, anointed him as Wall Street's new global thinker. Please help me welcome author, market maven, renaissance man, and chairman of Rockefeller International, Ruchir Sharma. Ruchir, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, Ruchir, you've written a book, What's Wrong with Capitalism? But in our own lifetimes, in our own professional lifetimes, the Dow has gone from 1,000 to 40,000. That's 40x. The number of billionaires in the world have gone from 13 to 3,000. It's capitalism finest hour. Why do you think it's wrong? Well, in terms of this is not my view in a way, which is the fact that, or not just my view, why did I write this book, right, in terms of what went wrong with capitalism? It's despite this incredible wealth creation that's happened at the top. If you look at the average person, especially in the Western countries, in places like even America, that has been such a standout economy for so long now, most Americans today feel that the economy or their country is moving in the wrong direction. In fact, two thirds of Americans feel that the country and economy are moving in the wrong direction. Most young Americans today, which are not, um, in terms of, especially if they're Democrats, they feel they would rather have socialism than have capitalism. So there's a huge angst in America, in the Western countries, about what really went wrong with capitalism. And often the solution that is coming up and we're seeing this even in the presidential campaign. If you hear people like Kamala Harris, even parts of Donald Trump's campaign out there, it calls for more and more government intervention. More populism. Uh, but I'd say more than just populism, it's about government intervention, that the government's the answer. Uh, whether they talk about price controls, whether they talk about uh, greater spending, greater subsidies, and even people like Trump about greater tariffs. These are all anti-market solutions is what they're talking about. So there's clearly somewhere a greater sort of, I mean, there's a distrust of what's happened uh, in terms of like the results that have come, that capitalism has worked for a few. It's led to this creation of incredible companies, oligopolies, and lots of billionaires, as you point out. But why is the average person in so many of these countries, and the situation is even more dire in the Western nations of France or UK, why are so many people feeling so disaffected? So the book is really an examination of that. And the conclusion that I reach in the book is in fact an ode to capitalism. It says that capitalism did not fail. It was ruined. And it was ruined by the series of government intervention that we have already seen from greater bailouts that take place that help the rich from the... That's 2008. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, in general, I chart the history of bailouts, which is that I say that in um, America, it was not the culture of the American government to bail out private sector companies. Correct. But then for the first time in 1984, you had the ba a bailout of a major financial, uh, financial Some uh, institution. Bank. No, yeah. that time was Continental Illinois. Continental and then Illinois. you had savings and loans in the late 1980s. And then you had LTCM in 1998. And you had a series of actions after that where the bailouts have gotten bigger and bigger uh, each time. And that leaves the average person feeling very disaffected that, okay, these great bailouts are happening for the rich and the almighty, and they are getting more and more entrenched. What about me? And then, like, also, what's happened to capitalism in America? The beacon of capitalism is now instituting 3,000 new regulations a year. Uh, and the total number of regulations that they've withdrawn over the last 20 years has been 20 in total. It's not really free, is that what you're saying? Yeah, so, that, so what is capitalism at its core? I begin the book you know, with my journey in India, with my growing up in India. As a socialist. As a socialist country. Right. And then for me, the value of capitalism, I, even when I was at a young age, was always that capitalism is about giving people economic freedom. That you give people economic freedom and you let their uh, individual initiative flower. That for me is the core of capitalism. And that economic freedom, I feel, has been increasingly taken away by bigger and bigger government over time. And that's distorting capitalism. Let me capitalism. correct you there, though, Richard. I mean, it's a fair point. But yeah. as you yourself pointed out in the book, 
so one in ten CEOs in American tech company happens to be Indian. And Indian has risen to the heights of pinnacle power by being the presidential nominee for a major party in America. So opportunity is still there, freedom is still there. Are, the, are you a capitalist at heart or a socialist at heart? No, no, I'm a complete firm believer in capitalism, but for me, the definition of capitalism and what capitalism to be is today has been severely distorted. I still feel America is a great place to be. It's a place, you know, like that. There's a little slogan in the book, in fact, which I use, which I uh, had seen, in fact, uh, somewhere using it like on a placard, which is that take someone was home. protesting. Exactly, someone was protesting against American occupation. Yankee, go home, own, but take me with you. But take me with you. So it's still a great place to be. But I, at heart, have prospered as well from a capitalist system. And there's a lot of good that America has to offer. But when the beacon of capitalism, the so-called land of the free, today has become a place where capitalism has been or is increasingly distorted. And you feel so many young Americans are saying they would rather have socialism than capitalism. I wanted to write a book to examine what's happened. Why have they lost faith in the current economic system? And possibly what can be done about it? And then what are the lessons for people like us in India? Because at the end of the day, we are still moving in a capitalist direction, but we are still far away from being a truly capitalist country. I'll get to that, Richard, but I wanted to ask you, you said you're a capitalist at heart and you've prospered, but you're not on the billionaire's list. Does that bother you? <laughs> of course, in terms of that, who wouldn't want to be a billionaire? <laughs> yeah, but, but why the opportunity was not there or you felt you were short of that opportunity? No, in terms of, listen, there are only 3,000 billionaires in the world and it's a very... And you, you saw know, like markets short. and you saw economies way yeah. ahead of other people, so... Yeah. Really, the opportunity was there for you. I'm very grateful for what I've been able to achieve. There's no end to it. I can look at the 3,000 people and say, why am I not there? Or I can look at the 7 billion people uh, in terms of in the rest of the world who possibly sort of are still struggling, uh, you know, to make enough to even have one decent vacation a year. Uh, and, and, and much poorer in places like India. Glass is half full for you. Uh, for me, in terms of that, I'm very happy with what I've been able to get. But there's no end to this creative dissatisfaction. Uh, and I guess I sort of have two careers in a way. I'm an investor, but I'm also a writer. And, uh, and I'm very happy at being able to do both. And I guess uh, rather than focusing my attention on just one. Uh, so I yeah, think that that's... You're really magnifying the world through your writing. So let me ask you to magnify. Uh, interest rates have a huge bearing on financial markets, as you know. In fact, more than even precedents have sometimes. Uh, there have been two benchmark uh, chairmen of the Fed who had different strategies, Paul Volcker in the 1980s and Alan Greenspan later on. Critique them for me. Who did what and who was right? Well, I, Volcker will, I think, in the pantheon of central bankers go down as possibly the greatest central banker because Why? he squashed inflation. And remember, nothing is worse for the poor and for the average than person inflation. than inflation. We've, we know that in India as well. In fact, in India also, as I say, that we don't know whether economic growth wins you election or not, but high inflation definitely loses you elections. Take out the bums. Yeah, the, throw the bums out. If you have high <laughs> inflation, that's the sentiment which comes. But now in terms of, you asked me specifically on, on Volcker with Greenspan. So Volcker fought this huge battle to through squash inflation, rates. generally through having tighter money, you know, right, in terms of, and, uh, he also cut interest rates when he had to cut interest rates after inflation was vanquished in a way and uh, in the mid-1980s he was cutting interest rates. Greenspan, as you know, uh, was fetid. In fact, in our investing years, when in India and in, in the early years, the biggest hero used to be Alan Greenspan and then he got thoroughly discredited. And I think when we look back, and I, I capture that in the book as well, that one of the big turning points in capitalism, possibly for the worse, was in 1987. He had just taken over as the Fed chairman. And the, the stock Dow market crashed. crashed by 20% on that Black Single Monday day. in October. Right. And as a reaction to that, for the first time, a Fed chairman decided that he's going to uh, explicitly prop up the stock market by cutting interest rates and pumping more liquidity in the system. And so that changed the risk behavior, I think, for investors too, which is that they knew that Greenspan was there. Uh, the Greenspan put, as it's called? That's right. So, you know, like, you're well versed with these terms. So that the fact that, uh, that Greenspan's there uh, to protect us on the, on the downside. Backstop the market, yeah. But on the upside, it's all free, right? So it, it became a sort of system now where it was capitalism on the uh, upside. They can capitalize your profits, but your risks will be socialized because at the slightest hint of any trouble, 
uh, you know, the, the, the Fed's there. And the reaction function has continued now. As you know that earlier this month, there was a one day big fall in global stock markets. And what happened after that? Everybody was rushing out to say the Fed needs to come and cut, cut interest rates right away. And the Fed seems all set to cut interest rates in September. So that's the reaction function. But when markets are going up, no one talks about raising interest rates. No, no. But when markets are going down at the slightest hint of any trouble, oh, we've got to do something to rescue markets from uh, falling. It's this asymmetry and risk is what I focus on the book, that this entire thing that no wonder you have the critiques of capitalism saying today that this is socialism for the rich. Because when you're behaving in this way, who are you benefiting? Right? You're benefiting the entrenched. You're benefiting the existing people who have a big stake in the system. You're benefiting the asset owners who tend to be rich people. Uh, the poor people don't own assets. Uh, and hence the rise places. of zombie companies, as you call it, right? Yeah, so zombie companies is the other side of it. So on one end, if you have so much easy money being poured into the system, it allows the rich, the entrenched, to become richer because they have access to that easy money. At the other end, uh, end of the spectrum, I call this zombification of capitalism, that when you have a lot of the... Uh, dead wood in the system is kept alive. That is also what leads to inefficiencies and explains, as I say in the book, the productivity paradox, that why do we have a decline in global productivity growth taking place when you have such a proliferation of new technologies out there? And as I say about the zombie companies, one of the most fascinating, I think, aspects in the book is that, you know, in the 1980s and 1990s, this term became popular in Japan, yeah. right? Because why? Because in Japan, the economy was going bust, and they decided back then that we've got to prop up these companies by easy money and stuff. And they came to be known as zombie companies. These were companies that did not earn enough profits to even cover their interest payments for three years in a row. The American media back then, including the very liberal left-wing media, such as the New York Times and stuff, would in fact mock these, uh, these companies, saying that this is America. We don't do this, uh, you know, keeping alive zombie companies. At that point in time, the number of zombie companies in America was about 2% of the total number of companies listed in America. Today, by some measures, that number is as high as 20%. Of the, zombie companies in America? Yeah, That's the 20% of companies listed in America today can, uh, by some definitions, be classified as zombie companies. And even by conservative definition, it's about 10%. So I'm just trying to just see how capitalism has changed. And there are consequences of this. You, because the question some people ask me, okay, so what? That you have all these zombie companies and uh, the government's rescuing, but the economy's, you know, like still doing okay and stuff. No, there are two major consequences of what's going on. Yeah. One is that productivity growth has declined. Because right. when you are interfering with the creative dynamism of an economy, you are interfering with the productivity mechanism in the economy. You're not allowing the deadwood to be cleared. And by keeping the deadwood there, you're discouraging new people from coming in at the pace that they should be coming in. And so that's the second consequence out there, which is that you're helping the entrenched, you're helping the incumbents. And so therefore, even in America, right up until the pandemic, the number of new startups was declining. And now you have a situation where the big companies are, you know, like are, are there and uh, for longer at, at the top end. And you have at the bottom these zombie companies floating and everything else in the middle uh, is getting squeezed out. So if you look at even America today, the economy seems to be okay at the surface, but uh, confidence among mid to small size businesses is plummeting. So I think that is the dichotomy and the large firms are doing well. I, I appreciate it. large firms are getting larger, but let me ask you this question reading back to India. Uh, first, do you feel that, uh, why should Indians pay attention to the Fed and the interest rate? As you speak, Jackson Hole is going to happen. Uh, is it important for emerging markets to see what the Fed is doing? Absolutely, because I think that as far as emerging markets are concerned, uh, that they're still very reliant on foreign capital, uh, you know, for their, for their economic growth. FDIs. Now, yeah, like FDI and like also for FII flows and stuff. Now, because the, the Fed is still the central bank of the world, the de facto central bank of the world, it still controls the price of money. It still has a lot of influence on that. Now, in India's case, the good thing which has happened is that a very strong domestic market has emerged in, uh, for flows. Uh, but most emerging markets don't, don't have, have a that. strong domestic market. So they are still very reliant on foreign capital 
to drive their stock market, to drive a lot of their economic growth. India has been able to set in motion the financialization process where it's less reliant on foreign capital. But many of the other emerging markets aren't so fortunate. So therefore, they care about it. So the Fed remains the central bank of the world. And the second aspect, I think, is the fact that many emerging markets don't have a strong enough domestic market to support both economic growth or equity market returns in the absence of foreign flows. You know, you may not remember this, but when John Kenneth Galbraith was uh, ambassador from America to India, he used to say that the finance minister of every emerging market should ha have his residence in Washington <laughs> because that's what determines, uh, you know, flows into their country. But uh, in the productivity mix that you talk about, in the flows we understand, but how is India doing in the productivity mix? Do you feel that we also slowing down in productivity or are poor capital income still is, you know, short, even though our absolute economy is growing. No, no, I mean, I think that there's no doubt that India is on the right economic trajectory, right? And that's in terms of the fact that if you look at the, like, even productivity growth in India, eh, over the last f a few years in particular, it's done pretty well. Of course, you can say that it's done almost too well because we haven't created as much employment. And, you know, when you uh, create high economic growth with low employment, it is naturally done, you know, uh, because of high productivity, but it leads to other consequences as well. So India in general, like is moving in the right direction. India is still sort of you know, moving in the direction of becoming more economically free. And we know that ever since we have become a more market oriented capitalist uh, type of economy, generally over the last 30 to 40 years, India has made faster economic progress. The point I make in, like the, uh, in the book as well is that were India to move even faster down that path of adopting more economic freedom, we could even achieve even higher growth rates because we are still, at the end of the day, if you look at the index of economic freedom or so, we are still in the, in the bottom quarter. Yeah, yeah. We are, you know, like in terms of in the bottom third at least, we still are a long way away from becoming a truly economically free country. So I and China, remember, even though it's a communist nation, became much more economically free by giving its people economic freedom. So that's one of the big paradoxes that we have to deal with, that we gave our people lots of political freedom, but we constricted their economic freedom. We started giving people more economic freedom but from Richard, the 1990s. you can't win elections. You're a free end of elections. You watch them so closely. You can't win elections by telling people you have to make tough choices, can you? No. So uh, I agree that as far as India is concerned, the polity is such where we cannot, uh, in terms of carry out the kind of reforms that China did, where they fired 100 million people in the public sector enterprises. You can't fire 50 people here. Exactly. So, so then let's also accept the fact that we will be growing at 6 percent or so, right, for the foreseeable future. The 9, 10, 11 percent growth rates that some of the East Asian countries achieved, including China, is going to be very hard for us to achieve, uh, given the kind of reforms that we are more inclined to do. Yeah. And not just what firing people, the land reforms, even labor reforms, are very difficult to do. But it's still, we have to at least be aware of what we are sacrificing for what we are doing. Now, as far as winning elections in India is concerned, it's a very complicated task. Uh, so to say that in terms of the fact that the fact is that most politicians in India still lose elections. So I'm not sure they're, uh, they've got the right formula done as yet, because if they were so smart, then they'd be able to win elections in India. But by handouts. Know, by uh, handouts. Uh, yeah. uh, if if, if, if <clears throat> winning elections in India was as simple as you just give handouts and you promise a lot of socialism. No one would, no incumbent would lose. No incumbent would lose, <laughs> because the incumbent always has the advantage of having tons of money with them. But yet most incumbents in India ever since it became a true multi-party democracy in the 1970s, have lost elections. Yeah, but uh, which is an interesting point. In the recent elections in the U.S., both Kamala Harris and Donald Trump are saying we will not tax tips. Is that a red flag to you somewhere? No, I think that, you know, like, there's a lot which is being said in the campaign, which is, appears populist and, and, you know, like, uh, stuff like that. I think the bigger red flag for me, what's happening in America today is this, that both the candidates today are making tons of promises and, they, and, and they're completely oblivious to what their deficit and debt situation is. 6% of GDP, unknown. 6% of GDP in the middle of an economic recovery. Right. You get 6% deficits if you have a sharp depression or a war. War, yeah. But you're getting 6% in the middle of an economic recovery out here. Can you imagine what the deficit will be when you actually have a downturn? It'll be 8, 9, 10% of GDP. So that worries me, that they're both making promises with complete impunity and there's no talk about it because the arrogance now in America has become that we can spend as much we want, we can run whatever deficits we want, 
no one's going to be able to put people money elsewhere. People will always buy dollars. People right? will always buy dollars. People will always but be that's here. That's a myth, right? That so sometime the reserve currency status can also change. It's happened in the last 600 years. Every 100 years has changed. Uh, before uh, Great Britain, Portugal, France. Yes, you know the list: Spain, Dutch. Before that, right. so they've so it's happened every 100 years. So they've, they're taking that for granted now because there's no alternative, and they've been aided by the fact that contenders such as China are, you know, like in possibly worse position uh, than Close even America markets, is uh, yeah. today. Close markets and even they're facing such a big headwind of debt and demographics, it's very hard for them to grow very rapidly from that pace uh, and they were closed system. So anyway, so I think that that's the like issue there. But what concerns me about America in the next year or two is that they're really tempting fate here by saying that in the past we would run budget deficits of 3% of GDP and we could ignore them. Now let's try 6% and let's see what happens. And if on this path, it could even be 7%. So they're really beginning to test We'll, we'll have to wait in America for the bond vigilantes to come back. They will put the government back into shape. Yes. But I want to talk back about with you to India. Yes. India is a unique model of development. We, the East, East Asian model, which you're so familiar with, export your way, start from low value, move to high value. India has a more service-oriented model, a more domestic economy. Explain our model to you and what do you think we get right and what do you think we're getting wrong? No, I'd say that in terms of that, there's no doubt that to create mass employment, you still need manufacturing to do better. And there's no reason why manufacturing and the share of the economy should stagnate around 14 to 15%. So yes, services is something we, we, we can do and maybe we can't take manufacturing to 25% of GDP like some of these successful East Asian countries took, but we still have it at 14 to 15%. At the end of the day, this is still a very tough country on the ground to do business in. The kind of regulatory state, the kind of government interface you have to do to, uh, and the ecosystem you have to deal with is still a very difficult nation. So in fact, even most foreigners are quite happy to give capital to local entrepreneurs and tell them you figure this out. But there's a big premium they pay to do that. It's still a very tough place on the ground to do business Since in. Since you watched Delhi for so long, and I have watched it too, I find it very frustrating that there's no right-wing party in India in terms of economic ideology. Absolutely. There used to be a Swatantra party, if you remember, <laughs> yes. uh, which is right-wing in ideology and believed in free markets. This country doesn't really believe in free markets yet, does it? No, in terms of, I think there's no party yes to like, articulate that. And I think that this policy, no one's come up with a cogent policy how to articulate that. And the only time we have carried out major reforms is when we have been in some sort of a crisis mode. So I think that that's just who we are. That's what I told you at the outset too, which is that Therefore, I never expected India to grow at 9-10%. In fact, when I wrote my first book, as you may recall, back in 2012, at that point in time, there was a lot of hype about BRICS, about India. And I sort of you know, tried to puncture that a bit by saying these BRICS are broken, it's all overhyped. And, and even for India, on which I was relatively more optimistic compared to the Brazils and Russias in that book, I, at that point in time, I had said that it's impossible for India to grow at 9-10%. And, uh, and then 8% was considered the floor. We, we all thought 8% was the God-given right. Now we have moved that down to 6%. Right. So in terms of, even though it's been a great decade for India in many ways, particularly from a stock market ways, let's not lose the fact that at a pretty low per capita income, we're still growing at about 6% or so, whereas these other miracle economies grew at, grew 10, at 9, 10, uh, like 11, 12%. Yeah. Uh, Richard, let me, uh, every bull market tells a story. Right? The Japanese bull market presaged the rise of Japan. Yes. Uh, the U.S. tech bull market presaged the rise of tech in our economy. This is the law, last man standing, as you've said, the Indian bull market. What is driving it? And what is the story behind it? Yeah, so I think there's no doubt that the fact that the economy is on the right trajectory is something which underpins it. Because, you know, one thing which people ask me, that are we in a bubble or not? And I say that, yeah, the market may be expensive, but a true bubble is when the market's going up and your earnings are going down, uh, which is what happens, by the way, at the end of your all big bubbles. Down. Yes, like even the tech, NASDAQ mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. that, the earnings growth began to really slow down. And I'm concerned in the US today, if you look at the top leading tech stocks, we're beginning to see that earnings growth slow down. In India's case, generally the earnings have done pretty well. And it's been a very broad-based economic uh, uh, rise of, of at least the stock market in terms of the various sectors have done well in India. So that way it seems grounded in the reality that the economy is, is, is moving in the right trajectory. But of course, it's been amplified by the fact that you've had this trend of financialization, which is that people in India hardly owned any equities, and now they've become used to pouring money into equities at every dip, every month. So that financialization that's happened is what has led to India now 
uh, trading at a big premium to other emerging markets. So this combination of the economy being the right trajectory, the fact that earnings growth has held up and now it's been, it's been fueled increasingly by the steady flow of domestic money is what I think has really helped but the Indian market. all bull markets end, right? Is yes. there something called a permanent bull market? Of course not. And, and even in India's case, we have seen, I mean, you have watched these markets and stuff. You have gone through patterns of ups and downs, you know, like, which are there. And that's my fear that a, a lot of the current generation has not really seen what a downturn can look like. But we have lived through those periods. I mean, there was a whole period which we lived through from uh, right up from, you know, 1994 till 2002, you'll remember. Uh, when, you know, the flat. Sensex would, you know, like keep trading between three and 4,000. Uh, you know, it was just a, such a frustrating time. But even then, you know, there was some really, uh, as what they call a unique term in India. There were a lot of multi-baggers even in that. Uh, Infosys was at that yes, time. Uh, yes, HDFC Bank, Infosys. Yeah. You had some, you know, some companies came out. So that's the great thing about India. I feel that there's no emerging market out there with a diversity of stocks that India has got and the diversity of sectors that India has. So the bull market is alive. But just to bring the historian back into you, yeah. I remember in America, uh, in the 70s bear market after the Nifty 50 bubble, yeah. the taxi medallion sold for more than the price of a Wall Street uh, seat on the Wall Street. I think it was $25,000 for a right. taxi medallion out there. That's how markets bottom out. So what would you fear uh, would be the red flags that would end this rally? I understand things are fine, earnings are improving, money is flowing in. What would be the red flags that you would be looking for? Yeah, so I think there are a couple of things out there. One, I think that if you, yeah, I mean, if earnings growth really begins to slow down, right, in terms of the overall stuff and the market keeps sort of hanging up there. I think that, you know, that sort of means that the momentum earnings is growth ending. Down, right. Earnings growth, you know, really begins to slow down. Second is if by any chance inflation comes back. Because if, you, if, if the central bank is forced to sort of tighten money uh, in this environment, I think that will be a big negative uh, for the market. Uh, currently, we're not seeing much signs uh, because, in fact, inflation still seems very really well behaved. And, and we're not seeing any great signs of a major earnings slowdown. Yeah, for the mid to small caps, I'm seeing some signs. But generally, I think earnings are still doing relatively well. So those are the two red flags that I would currently see. Having said that, I personally feel that other emerging markets today uh, have greater opportunity just because they're trading so cheap uh, in terms of that. You've got markets from Poland to Indonesia. So some of those trading at single digit PEs and have decent growth profiles. As you well know, in, in, in investing, low PEs or low valuations are value traps often. Of course. But I'd say that if you have growth as well, <laughs> so many of these markets are ignored out there. So I'd say the opportunity is there. And so as in, the investor in me would tell people, diversify a bit outside to the extent that you can. But on its own, otherwise, the market in terms of, as I said, that uh, I don't see the, these really big red flags pop up. Uh, as I yet. understood. Luchir, but you've worn many hats in your uh, career. You've been Morgan Stanley's chief uh, investor in India. Give me a broad idea. You don't see the red flags. Where would you invest? Which sectors? Which uh, companies? Just give me an idea of where you would find opportunity in India if I was res restricting myself to India. No, I'm, so as far as India is concerned, in terms of I still feel that the CAPEX cycle has ways to go out here. They, you know, the, this has just begun. I still feel the real estate cycle has some way to go because remember, we're coming after, out of these things after very long downturns. So these are just about picking up. I think that the consumer in India will always offer you some opportunity out there in terms of that, uh, you know, what they can do. Now, the mix may change. has become much more towards digitization, much more e-commerce compared to the old consumer model of just buying cars and two-wheelers and stuff. So it evolves. But I think that these two, three kind of sectors in India still generally seem to be on an up, uh, a multi-year uptrend. CapEx consumers. Let me ask you one last question about the markets. Uh, You've been saying about the public sector, the benign neglect, yes. that privatization through the back door is happening. But these stocks had a brilliant run in the last three, four years. Uh, isn't that, do we need to privatize them now or is this fine? I think it's a great to time to do that, no? Because you didn't want to, so we can't have it both ways. When I would make this argument for the last 10 years, the, argue, the counter I would get is, it's so valuations cheap, are so valuations cheap. are so cheap, why should we throw away our jewels at such a <laughs> low price? Okay, fine. Now that, yeah. You know, there's been a valuation reset. They're still, over any long-term time frame, they're still underperformed the broader market, right? And the, and the private sector stuff. They're Even catching up. They're catching <laughs> up quickly. But I'm saying, but this may be like a good time to it. And my thing is, not that you should just whole-scale privatize everything, but get the balance correct, 
right? Which is that why should in, in some sectors you have such a heavy involvement of the public sector, like banks even and stuff. L let's do some of it. Is it going to happen? I don't think so. So there's no point us talking too much about it. But theoretically... We have no Margaret Thatcher. We, <laughs> well, you've answered that. I mean, I don't think so in terms of that. And I think that in terms of it needs to be sold properly too, that what do you do with those profits? Let's give the profits away to, you know, like the people back to, to make it popular. Something needs to be done. Invested in, in infrastructure, or, productivity gains. Or to give it, exactly, or to give it back to people as well in terms of it so that there's no protest against it and you have the more money, some, some goes back to the people. But as you said, we don't have a constituency We have no for constituency that. for this. Uh, and th so, I, uh, like in India, I've long given up, you know, telling people what should be done and not be done. It just doesn't happen. India grows on its own, India grows at night. <laughs> you believe in all that stuff? Well, in terms of, not really. I think that, you know, you still have to keep doing stuff. If you ask me what's the biggest risk to the so-called India story, as everyone loves to talk about it, it is complacency which is the fact that nothing needs to be done. You sit back and all these gains will just roll on. You know, we have made the mistake before. Even in the late 2000s, we made that mistake. We confused a global boom to be just an India boom then, and we spent like crazy. And then, we, you know, when the global boom ended, we had a big check to pay, which we couldn't fund. And then we had to do a course correction for many years before the story resumed again. So those cycles can happen. So far, no big signs of that, but yeah, complacency is the biggest danger to, to any growth story. As I sort of wrote a recent piece about this, that uh, in the past I would write only about breakout nations, but now there are also breakdown nations, which are countries which grew very well for a period of time and have uh, faltered off late. Canada, Germany, in emerging markets, the Chile's, the South Africa's, all these countries have fallen by the wayside in the last few years after being celebrated as huge success stories at some point in time in the last 10 or 20 years. Correct. Richard, you give me long form answers to many of my questions, but I also enjoy doing a rapid fire with you so I can pick your brains on a variety of subjects. Are you game for that? Let's, let's do it. Let's try it, okay. Especially if it's about the book. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I will introduce the book also. Um, would you rather have a drink with Usain Bolt or Sachin Tendulkar? Usain Bolt for me because I'm a sprinter, as you possibly yes, know. Yes. And I think that uh, in terms of that's just world class. So Usain Bolt. Okay. But would you rather go to an IPL final or would you rather watch a high wattage Bollywood premiere show? I would say in terms of IPL, you know, like the other piece, as you know, I wrote was that IPLs in a secular More uptrend cricket. in terms of and Bollywood just seems to have lost the plot. So okay. even though I'm a movie buff in general, I just feel that Bollywood has lost the plot, whereas cricket is still, you know, in a secular growth phase. Interesting. That's a really acute observation. You're right. A promoter in India that you admire? Um, I don't know if there's any one in terms of it. I mean, there's so many promoters in India that I like admire and you know some of them are, these are personal friends of mine so very hard for me to pick one person try but, but no i'd say like you know like very hard for me to just name one per person name i mean in terms of but you know they're all these are all friends of mine in terms of like they've all fought you know like in terms of great battles they've built great businesses so uh, in terms of very hard for me to pick one person there okay fair enough a market maven whose views you eagerly look forward to hearing you know, uh, this is one thing which I've discovered about markets and stuff. That, for example, the one person that I respect a lot as a huge macro investor is Stanley Druckenmiller. But the one thing I've learned, and I think this is even a cautionary tale for some of your viewers as well, is that it's great to listen to them, but remember one thing. They can change their mind on a dime, and they're not, and they're not obliged to tell you. So try to hear the insight but for people who just follow that I'm going to follow this one's advice. Might be too late sometimes. Might be too late or they may change their mind and they're not obliged to tell you about that. Of course. So uh, get the perspective, but if you follow them to buy and sell stuff, good Be luck. careful. A financial publication that you always read. I'm biased. I'm a columnist for the Financial Times. For me, that is the true global newspaper, right? In terms of what they stand for, what they bring to the table. And so that's for... Uh, I would say Financial Times. And I would say the Sunday edition is extraordinary. Just yeah. reading the yeah, The Sunday weekend edition is like a yeah. great sort of offset in terms yeah. of, you know, like the weekend, it's, it's yeah. there. And, and in fact, uh, even for my book, uh, the first place I thought about writing the main essay was for the weekend edition. Yeah, which I read often. Yeah. Um, if you could invite any three people, living or dead, <clears throat> for dinner, I won't say drinks because I know you're a teetotaler. <laughs> Who would you invite? No, in terms of the fact that, you know, there's so much I want to understand about. I'd say that I really, you know, like 
when I, when I went to South Africa, the one person I totally admired a lot was Nelson Mandela because I went to Robben Island. I remember writing about this, that how do you go through those 20 years of oppression? No enmity with and no en Exactly, and no enmity out there, right? I mean, that for me is fantastic. The one person in the current sporting arena who have, you know, like in terms of, I've been fortunate enough to sort of uh, uh, be like in his, uh, close to his family box and watched him for the last 10 years is Djokovic. And for me, that's, you know, just been a great thing uh, as investors, uh, something which I would like to, I think like in investing, I think the most underestimated skill is uh, temperament and the most overestimated is analysis. But I'd say that why I admire people like him are people who, are, who have such mental toughness. I think mental toughness is something which I deeply admire. So he's another person that, you know, who's become my favorite sporting person more because of the mental... Mental toughness, mental toughness and toughness the attitude he brings. And the attitude and the you hunger. You made a fan of my daughter-in-law because she's also a Djokovic fan. Yes. Great. Um, what fascinates you more? The Indian election of 2024 or the U.S. election of 2024? No debate. Indian election. Really? Yeah. Ah, you're, you wear your sleeve as an Indian still. That's right. Because you live I've done, in New York, but you're in I've India. done 31 election trips in yeah. India. Written books. Uh, I've written a book about it. Mm. It's like 25 years since I've done that. Mm. I emotionally connect with India. This is where my heart lies. Okay. A new, you mentioned Sweden, uh, sorry, Vietnam, uh, Switzerland. Taiwan, Switzerland. Give me a new breakout nation. No, as I said that in terms of, I think there are lots of emerging markets today with great opportunity. So, I mean, it's very interesting how some have come back from the dead. And this is a instructive to us. Ten years ago, the basket case in the world was Greece. The biggest comeback story of the last decade has been Greece. Tells you what happens when nations carry out economic reform. Poland could be the next country to become a developed country. Uh, then I think that the likes of in Southeast Asia, I think Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines are all doing well. So a smattering of nations are doing well. The next nation to become a developed country, which is a very rare occurrence, because very 200 rare. countries in the world, uh, 40 only are classified as developed. Everything else is emerging. Next country likely to become a, a developed nation, and that's where you know is in the news these days because the prime minister is also there is Poland. So I think that uh, yeah, that's yeah, a nation yeah, that we can speak about. I have yeah. also heard similar stories out yes. there. Last question to you, sir. Uh, Viksit Bharat by 2047, yes or no? So I'm not sure what that even means. If it means that we're going to become a developed country, answer, the math isn't supported, right? If 6% if you grow from now from a $3,000 per capita income base, how do you become a developed country by 2047? And the other thing which, as you know, which I've always said so, which is that I don't believe in making such long-term 20-year forecasts. As that saying goes that, you know, that the uh, new rule of forecasting is that neither you nor I'll be here to know whether we were right or wrong. <laughs> right. So I'm happy to make forecasts for the <clears throat> maximum this decade. Hmm. Anything beyond that, I don't know. So as I said, but just mathematically, even if we compound at 6% till then, it's going to, I mean, we need to compound at 10% real GDP growth to get anywhere close to that ambition. Unlikely. I think so, right? The math says that. Yes, that's yeah. right. Thank you, Ruchir, so much for coming on my show, Icons. Citius, Altius, Fortius. That means faster, higher, stronger. And it is the motto of the Olympic movement. I'm sure Ruchir joins me in wishing the same for the global economy and markets. Ruchir, many thanks for your insights and many thanks for writing this wonderful book, What Went Wrong with Capitalism by Ruchir Sharma. It's a must read. You will really find lots of nuggets on it. Thank you so much again for coming on the show. And we'll see you soon on another episode of Icons. Bye for now.